Okay, uh, that's uh, impressive stuff. Our final speaker today is Dr. Lee Swanstrom, a professor at uh, OHSU, also a uh, well-renowned thoracic as well as endoscopic surgeon who's going to talk to us about the role in 2013 of, of surgery for this disease. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeff and Haru. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, talk about esophageal surgery, my favorite topic. Um, and uh, this is going to be a little bit of a recap because you've already heard bits and pieces of this and hopefully this will put it into some context. <coughs> So um, we'll talk a little bit about what the current indications in, the, in this era of ESD and uh, RF ablation are for uh, treatment specifically of early cancers. I think we all know about advanced cancers. And um, this doesn't seem to forward. Uh, there we go. No disclosures for this. Uh, so indications, uh, or at least over my career, have evolved quite a bit for esophagectomy. Uh, early on, we used to see a lot of benign indications for, for uh, esophagectomy, and these days, it's almost all for some type of cancer, whether it's early cancer or advanced cancer. But I want you to keep this slide in mind as I talk, because I think there are indications for minimally invasive esophagectomy beyond cancer. So I, I want to include that, because you haven't heard, we haven't really discussed that uh, so far. Uh, you, you know the demographics of this, uh, that uh, worldwide, uh, there's a shift towards adenocarcinoma, Barrett's cancers. As, as you've seen, uh, these are uh, uniquely well treated in an early phase, uh, and we're seeing more and more of them. So early tre treatment of cancers is an important topic. It's, if you do esophagectomies, it's been a little bit of a sad thing because the easy esophagectomy patients are kind of gradually going away. Uh, we have definitive chemoradiation, which uh, is taking an increasing marking market share, ablation technologies, endoscopic resections, uh, so all these early cancers are really shifting away from esophagectomy, and in fact, in an esophageal program, it's becoming rare that you even get to see these patients. Uh, so if all you offer is surgery, uh, it's a shrinking market there. And this is in spite of the fact that surgery has made dramatic advances as far as mortality rates and uh, morbidity rates even, although it remains a very morbid uh, procedure even if you do it a, with laparoscopic or thoracoscopic techniques. Uh, but certainly the mortality rate's gone down dramatically over the last 20 years. On the other hand, esophagectomy really gets a bad rap. Uh, these are actual patient quotes from my own patients. Uh, my internist told me I'd be better off dead than with a horrible quality of life after esophagectomy. They said that nobody over the age of 65 would survive an esophagectomy. And the nurse said I would never be able to eat again and have to be fed through a tube for the rest of my life. So this is what uh, patients bring uh, in with them. So no wonder that, the, uh, that we're not seeing quite as many. And to be perfectly honest, uh, adjuvant therapy is becoming much more refined, better uh, specified, and we can select the patients better, and it's got good outcomes. And in fact, overall, it's got almost equal outcomes uh, as surgical resection. Now, it's uh, not quite as benign. It has a 17% mortality rate uh, for definitive chemoradiation as well. So um, uh, survival rates might be equal to surgery, but uh, quality of life um, and uh, morbidity is quite high as well. Uh, you heard about RFA. This has had a tremendous impact on kind of uh, the easier esophagectomy patients. And in fact, in our own experience, we've seen a dramatic decrease in the number of early cancers that we treat, and you can see uh, a gradual uh, disappearance of esophagectomy, even minimally invasive esophagectomy, uh, for the indication of Barrett's with high-grade dysplasia and inter intermucosal cancers, and these have been replaced in our own practice with EMR or ablation um, te technology. So uh, th this is just uh, better for patients and the way things should go. But I'll give you this as my hypothesis, e even in spite of this and the general trend that there's still a need for esophagectomy in the field of esophageal cancer, uh, particularly for advanced uh, and higher grades. A and I would say because of this bad rap and because of the morbidity that if there's going to be surgery for esophageal cancer, it's going to be minimally invasive surgery of some sort. If you're in an esophageal program and you don't offer an uh, esophageal surgery program and you don't offer a minimally invasive uh, option, for it, you're going to gradually not see any patients because there's other less morbid ways of doing it and patients just won't have it. 
So there's definitely advantages to a minimally invasive esophagectomy, uh, great node dissection so you can get regional clearance um, and prevent uh, at least local recurrence, which is a very morbid way to, to die from recurrent cancer, uh, perhaps less tumor manipulation, preservation of host immune response. We've seen this in colorectal cancers where there's a higher number to actually document this. Probably true in esophageal cancers as well. We're starting to see early data that support that. Uh, get the patients off to adjuvant therapy quicker. Uh, they don't have large uh, incisions to heal up from, so they can go get started on uh, supplemental therapy. And just a bit beneficial psychological impact. Patients uh, seem to do quite a bit better uh, if they don't look down and see a three foot long scar. Uh, the morbidity of uh, minimally invasive surgery is dramatically less than it is for open. It's still quite high in the realm of things, but uh, uh, the, the severity of the complications uh, seem to be less, but uh, still a large number of patients get them. But uh, it, it definitely uh, with the growing experience and growing data of minimally invasive esophagectomy, we know that it's a less morbid and less uh, subject to at least severe complications. And I think for early cancers, which we're talking about here, uh, there's even less invasive alternatives that are very intriguing. And this is a report um, uh, from Steve Demeester on vagal sparing esophagectomy, which has a very, very low mortality and morbidity rate and an excellent quality of life on this. And this is quite doable with minimally invasive laparoscopic, thoracoscopic techniques. Uh, so vagal preserving may be an option for these patients and certainly worth considering particularly for the early cancers or non-malignant uh, recommendations for um, esophagectomy. So what are the indications today uh, at this date for early cancers or, or high-grade dysplasia? We've heard this um, already. Uh, uh, there's several options out there, whether it's endoscopic ablation, uh, not doing anything and simply following these uh, uh, patients, not uh, something we'd actually recommend, or I think surgery has a role as well. So the remaining indications for esophagectomy, persistent dysplasia in spite of multiple ablations, and we draw that number at five. There's simply some patients that you cannot ablate with RF or cryo, uh, or if you do ablate them, it comes right back. It's not a large number, but you certainly see these patients. A failure of ESD, so you do ESD and either uh, you can't accomplish it, or as Haru showed, you end up with submucosal invasion. Uh, end stage esophagus and high grade dysplasia. So uh, it's great to do all this laborious surgery uh, for a healthy esophagus, but if the patient has a bad esophagus, is it really worth saving? And sometimes patients don't want to go through or can't because they live far away, uh, kind of the repeat labor that's involved with uh, conservative therapies. They want a definitive therapy, either they live in a rural area where they don't have access to neoadjuvant uh, therapies or they just sim simply can't come back for frequent surveillance uh, type of endoscopies. So uh, ablation techniques are great, but as I mentioned, not all patients can respond uh, to it. This is a paper that we did where we looked at uh, RF patients uh, and these patients came to, were referred to us because they couldn't be ablated. They had an average uh, of 5.5 ablations, as many as 26 barrack sessions, which is obviously crazy. Uh, and the predictors that we found of non-response were long segment Barrett's, extremely long segment Barrett's, and type three parasophageal hernias, and that's probably an anatomic distortion of the esophagus that prevents good contact or good coverage for ablation. And this is a very recent paper, just came out uh, online uh, uh, by Ralph A. and his group in Seattle, outcomes in patients who have failed endoscopic therapy for dysplastic Barrett. So they took also a group of patients uh, who were ablated and couldn't be ablated. 28 of them had a successful eradication of their disease, but endotherapy failed in 10 patients. So a fairly high uh, number that they see in this high volume um, um, center. And these patients went on to have esophagectomy, which is quite uh, successful in this group, uh, either showing uh, persistent dysplasia or some with uh, progression uh, to cancer, as you heard about as well, buried glands or whatever the reason was. And uh, these patients did quite well with um, um, surgery or I think they had some that were not surgical candidates and had chemo, chemo radiation 
and uh, once again did well. So there are groups that just don't respond to these um, less invasive treatments. And ESD can be a tricky thing, it can be a tricky thing to do optical uh, diagnosis. Uh, biopsies, of course, are subject to, to uh, location bias. You're only biopsying less than 1% of the area, so you can miss it. We know that submucosal invasion in esophageal cancers can be quite aggress aggressive and uh, that these lesions can present with clonal clumps of cancer or submucosal uh, skip areas in a large percentage of patients. And as you heard before, uh, once these tumors go deeper and start getting into submucosal, the node uh, incidence uh, skyrockets uh, and uh, obviously ESD is not going to cure a patient with an extramural node and uh, these patients would benefit uh, from esophagectomy. And we know that if you clear the nodes, you offer the patient, in these cases, uh, the best chance of a cure. And this just uh, is what we all know, that uh, good on-block node clearance uh, has a high uh, cure rate when the no nodes are regionalized. And this just shows a, a, a lesion that was uh, on EUS, um, this is one that I just did a few weeks ago. On EUS, it looked like it was a, a mucosally based um, a lesion. And yet when we did a lift for her ESD, his ESD, you can see he had a very poor raise. So this is a failed lift sign uh, for the ESD. And this is in spite of biopsies showing this just to be high grade dysplasia with intermucosal and uh, EUS showing this to be intermucosal. And so you hear, see here uh, a clear failed lift, injected it, and the center stayed tethered. And this is an obvious indication for a deep invasion uh, of this uh, particular lesion. So a failed lift, or uh, if you do an ES, ESD and it did involve the submucosal layers, uh, we think that it should go on to have an esophagectomy if they're at all a surgical candidate. And then I mentioned, um, once again, and I'll stress this as my last comment, that uh, there's some esophaguses that just aren't worth saving, um, even if they have just Barrett's with high-grade dysplasia. So when we have a patient that looks like this, uh, multiple previous fundal plications or a giant hiatal hernia, a totally rad ratty, amodile esophagus, uh, yes, we could do ESDs on these patients and work a long period of time and subject them to recovery, but really they have a poor poor quality of life because of their underlying disease, and a patient like this is going to be better served with a, a resection. And this can be for motility disorders, uh, as you see here, like achalasia um, and Barrett's, or uh, simple failed, uh, uh, failed previous uh, treatments. So in summary, uh, ablation and endoscopic resection is a treatment of choice, no doubt about it. It's great for patients. It's well tolerated. Um, in 85 to 96% of, of the time, but there's still indications for esophagectomy and e even in early disease, and I strongly feel that minimally invasive esophagectomy is uh, critical to be able to offer patients um, in a cancer program because patients are very biased against, uh, or maybe not the patients, but their masters are biased against uh, a surgical approach, uh, and it appears that there are true morbidity and survival advantages to MIE at this stage of the game. Thank you.